Um, well, welcome guys. Um, this is a talk I've given every year for the last nine years. And as I say every year, the time I get to give it gets shorter and shorter and shorter, yet the field has exploded, exploded, exploded. So this is going to be not even a 35,000 foot overview. It's like a, a 90,000 foot overview, you know, now that we're going to space all the time. Um, so I'm going to talk about neurostimulation as a whole. So neurostimulation is the idea of applying an electrical current to parts of the nervous system. And it's one subset of neuromodulation. Uh, the other end of it, if you will, is intrathecal drug delivery. Um, and some people would even consider radiofrequency ablation as a part of neuromodulation because you are modulating the nerves. But nonetheless, we're going to focus on neurostimulation, which I've divided into uh, at least below uh, the neck, spinal cord stimulation, or I should say below the skull, spinal cord stimulation, DRG stimulation, and peripheral nerve stimulation. We're not talking about anything about deep brain stimulation or other forms of stimulation within the brain. As Doug already alluded to, I'm from Marin County. Um, people like to say Marin, that's fine. Um, <laughs> we like to be special. And if you're wondering where that is, uh, if you've ever been to the Golden Gate Bridge, we're just across it. So we connect San Francisco uh, to Marin, and then our practice is about six miles up the road. I work with an orthopedic practice. Uh, we have two spine surgeons, and then of course joints, uh, sports, et cetera. And as Doug alluded to, I was at, in academics for five years and then made the leap to private practice five years ago. And so if, if some of you have questions about academics versus private, absolutely talk to me about it. I can give you some, my insight and, and give you some tips and tricks. So you'll see all of us uh, do consult with a lot of different companies. And um, you might think, oh, well, these guys are super conflicted and they're money hungry or greedy and, and maybe. But the truth is, for me personally, I like to be involved in everything. I like to be at the forefront of all these new technologies. And I like to immerse myself completely in them, kind of figure out, help them strategize about how we can bring to market, if it's even worth to bring to market. So it's something you guys should think about. Um, if, you, if you think you're going to do what you're doing during your fellowship for the rest of your life, you're absolutely wrong. 90% um, of what I do today, I never learned in fellowship. Okay, so, and, and most of what you're going to see today was not available in fellowship for me 11 years ago. So really important to kind of get involved, um, and we'll talk about some of the ways you can do that. So this is the table of contents, give you a brief history about uh, spinal cord stimulation and neurostimulation in general, talk about the safe principles, go through the evidence. I've updated that for this year. I've updated the vendors for this year, those who have FDA approval and even those that don't who are upcoming. We'll go through the guidelines that you can use to help you uh, do high quality, safe, effective neurostimulation. We'll talk about the plethora of societies that exist in the space and how to navigate, you know, who to work with. And then last but not least, tracking outcomes, which I think is a really important subject for the next 10 years. And we have Neil here, Dr. Shawnard, who uh, has really done a great job in, in helping us do that with the Table of Six group. Uh, and I'm sure he's going to talk about that uh, later on today. So this is the seminal paper regarding the use of spinal cord stimulation in humans. If you haven't seen it, I think it's worth a read. Um, this is Dr. Norm Sheely, who was a neurosurgeon uh, who was practicing at the time in La Crosse, Wisconsin at Gunderson Clinic, which is actually one of the places I did my rotations during medical school. And what he did was he uh, implanted uh, an array, a bipolar array, directly onto the spinal cord. This is not in the epidural space. This is directly sutured to the spinal cord for a patient who had terminal breast cancer, end of life uh, situation with horrible pain. Um, and in the few days that the neurostimulation was on, the patient did describe some benefit. There were no uh, standardized outcome measures like an ODI, VAS, or anything like that. It was just a sub subjective experience. Um, and unfortunately, the patient passed away. Um, but the, the way the system was used was basically through the skin. There was no wireless technology at that time. It was connected to a large pulse generator that was sitting next to bedside. Um, so that was the first use in humans, and uh, interestingly, the authors tried to get this into a neurosurgical journal, and none would accept it. So they went to the lowly anesthesiologist, uh, anesthesia and analgesia accepted it uh, in 1967, and I think it was it's one of the very important papers uh, in our field. So what's happened ever since then? Um, in 1971, in Japan, first use of epidural electrodes. 1978, going from two electrodes to four, 
1981 was the first use of an implantable uh, impulse generator. Uh, so the batteries under the skin. So prior to that, everything was connected externally. Okay, just think about the progress in technology, um, processing, uh, capacitance, et cetera, Moore's Law. So that's what you're seeing over time. And I hope you're appreciating the, the reduction in time gaps as things change. So we're kind of in this exponential curve. Uh, so that's why it's a really fun time to be in this field. Then we went to eight electrode arrays. And, and by the way, guys, when these things happened, it was like a huge deal. Like we went from four to eight to 16. And now we don't think twice about those kinds of things. We're like talking about feedback and whatever else the future holds. So we'll get to that. Um, rechargeable IPGs, the idea of, of recharging it. And that, that wasn't until 1994. Otherwise, before that, it was primary cell, which are, quote unquote is non-rechargeable. Um, being able to use it in an MRI uh, conditionally was in 2007. Uh, then we got 16 electrode arrays, which we'll talk about today. You'll see Dr. Lee do that. Positional sense, which would try to adapt the stimulation based on the position of the body. Uh, and then in 2015, a very important time in the field, uh, high frequency stimulation came out, level one randomized control trial, the Senza RCT. Uh, and then soon after, uh, we had the Burst DR simulation platform, also evidence based, based on the Sunburst trial published in 2017. And then DRG stimulation, which was brought um, to the field by a different company, but then was acquired by St. Jude Medical and then became Abbott, was FDA approved also in 2016. That's a totally different form of stimulation. We're going to talk about that today. I'm going to, I'm going to demonstrate it for you guys. And then in 2019, it's almost kind of a return to um, miniaturization uh, with the micro stimulator and then remote programming the idea uh, from COVID of programming patients without actually being close to them. Uh, and this is what a lot of the companies are now getting into. We learned that from the COVID epidemic. Um, one of my first cases was a patient who had just been implanted the week before the shutdown in California. Uh, and, and generally, you know, within the first two weeks we had to program. Uh, it was the first time, at least in my experience, that we were programming a patient from one car to the other car in our parking lot because we couldn't be face to face, right, during that time. Um, so that seems kind of silly now, but that was cool then. And there are going to be situations where remote programming is really helpful. I had a patient who lived in an RV traveling all around the United States, um, went to New Mexico for a friend and then like had some issue and we were able to fix it remotely, which is pretty cool. Feedback systems approved this year. Um, so the idea of, of measuring certain electrical potentials in the nervous system to adapt or change stimulation which can help with positional variance or, or Valsalva or other things that can happen. Um, so I'll talk about that with uh, Saluda primarily being the flag bearer there. And then remote therapeutic monitoring, um, which is an interesting topic right now because <clears throat> the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services now reimburses you to follow patients. This actually comes from the cardiac world to give you some incentive to follow what your patients are doing on a periodic basis. Um, so there is a spinal cord simulation comp company coming to market that's really gonna look at that to really ensure that you're optimizing the therapy. Um, and our lunch talk will actually talk about that to some degree. How many of you know what the safe principles are? All right, nobody. Um, so S stands for state safety, A stands for appropriateness, F is fiscal neutrality, and E is efficacy. And what the safe principles are really there to outline is, is how do you assess a new technology? So you can think about this beyond neurostimulation. You can think about this for anything. So you have to ask yourself, is this a safe procedure to do? Is it appropriate for the indication you're trying to treat or manage? How much does it cost? Is it going to sink Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services? Is it effective? Of course. And, and how do we know if it's effective? We need evidence. So if you can apply these principles to everything you do in medicine, you're better off for it. Um, it's fairly basic, but anytime like you hear about a new product, just ask yourself these questions. Is it safe, appropriate, you know, fiscally neutral, however you want to define that, uh, and effective? And if you, if you keep that mantra, uh, you'll do well. So this is the updated level one studies list. Um, I mentioned, I, for our field, I feel that the Ascenza RCT published in anesthesiology in 2015 was, was groundbreaking because prior to that, although we had prospective trials 
Um, a lot of it was case series. A lot of it was compared to um, different forms of stimulation, and, and some of these are as well. Um, or it would be compared to uh, reoperation on another spine surgery, uh, like Dr. North. But the Senza RCT really you know, took us to the next level. It was randomized, as I mentioned. It was comparing that form of stimulation to our traditional approach of tonic stimulation, and they proved not only non-inferiority, but superiority. And subsequent to that, as you can see, we have the study, the ACCURATE trial, which is the trial looking at dorsal root ganglion stimulation in patients with causalgia, or CRPS. Uh, and then the uh, sunburst trial was the one looking at burst DR. So that's a proprietary waveform specific to that company. And then since then, uh, the Evoke study and the Avalon studies are the two studies uh, performed by the group working with Saluda, which is the feedback or ECAPS studies, uh, again, showing really good outcomes. Uh, and then DTM uh, with Fishman and the group published last year. Uh, supporting, you know, again, fantastic outcomes, seeing pain scores getting down to twos and threes. And then I highlight this, this study from last year uh, by Erica Peterson and, and the group because, for me, this was the first time we had condition-specific evidence in spinal cord stimulation. The other studies here looked at pain of the trunk and limbs. Very generic, right? That could be anything. They could be lumbar radix, spinal stenosis, CRPS, knee arthritis. I mean, sure. And, and you have to understand there's a reason for that, right? Because you want to get enough patients into your pool to do the study, but what you lose is the specificity, right? So I can't really say, even to this day, what the effectiveness of spinal cord stimulation is for moderate spinal stenosis. I can't even say what it is exactly for lumbar radiculopathy, you know, one dermatome or two dermatomes, whatever it is, because all these studies take these very broad indications. But this painful diabetic neuropathy, you can identify that. That's a specific condition. And they proved that their therapy was significantly better than conventional medical management, the normal stuff we do, glucose control, neuropathics, um, uh, rehabilitation, whatever else. Um, so that is what I think is really important for our future in this field is having condition specific evidence, because you guys know this as physicians or healthcare providers, you can't just give me a, a, a device and say, all right, you go figure out how to use it. What do we do? We're diagnosticians. We see this patient, we figure out with all our tests, this patient has lumbar stenosis. Okay, now I have to think, what do I have in my armamentarium for lumbar spinal stenosis based on the evidence, right? So the, the challenge with spinal cord stimulation historically has been like, when do I use it? Like a lot of providers in this country do not use it. It's underutilized. A lot of us know if they see quote unquote, I hate this term, failed back surgical syndrome. All right, I'm thinking spinal cord stimulation. Or if they see hardware in the spine and the patient's not doing well, I'm thinking spinal cord stimulation. Uh, but we need to be better than that. We, we've got to understand exactly what we're dealing with, and that's when we'll see our outcomes improve and, and you know, not do this in patients who won't improve. So I just drop that in there for you guys to think about. As you look at the evidence going forward, we need to see condition-specific evidence. So this gives you a gross comparison of the spinal cord simulator systems. I've updated it for, for this year. Um, some of the things people ask, like, is this MRI conditional? Do they have a paddle? You know, how many contacts? You know, th that used to be a bigger deal when I first started doing this than it is now. Um, the IPG, like the big, the big topic, you know, 10 years ago is the current versus voltage. We've kind of put that all aside now. Everyone's using current. Uh, but, but pretty much everybody is now having a rechargeable primary cell system. They'll tell you their bells and whistles when you go out into the fishbowl. Um, one company here, second from the right, Nalu, has a, a micro IPG that has an external disc that powers it. Um, and then they all have their different proprietary waveforms. Uh, as, I, as I mentioned, FDA approval earlier this year with Saluda, looking at feed get, feedback with ECAPS. So it's a paresthesia-guided waveform. The waveform is modulated based on the input from ECAPS. So very interesting time in our space. And then off to the right is a company that uh, very nicely sponsored us, will be coming to market in the next year, um, who has a long history in cardiac rhythm management device. They are out of Germany. 
And uh, they are they have made the decision to go into neuromodulation, neurostimulation. So they're going to come out with their platform. Um, and we're going to talk about some of the details about how they're approaching the market. Um, so if you're using one of these systems only in your fellowship, you got to look at all of them. It's really easy to get tribal and say, I'm Medtronic. I'm Boston Scientific. I'm Abbott, whatever. You know, uh, you see it. You go to the society, you go to NANS, you see that. But it's really important, especially as fellows, open your mind, try everything, talk to the reps or other people doing the other therapy so you have a better understanding of what's out there, and then you'll decide what's best for your patients. So it's not who takes you out to the nicest dinner or whatever else. It, it's really you know, making sure you learn about everything, and then you know, like this table. This is literally a table I did was as a fellow to kind of figure out you know, what does this one do uh, and who would benefit from this. When I was a fellow, uh, MRI conditionality was a, a huge deal. And so there were systems that did have it and systems that didn't have it. So if I had a patient who needed an MRI periodically, like a multiple sclerosis patient, I went for the MRI conditional, right? So you got to understand all these intricacies. And the conditions of MRI conditionality are all different from each of these companies. So you really have to understand that. Um, because what you hate to do is say, oh, it's MRI conditional to a patient. They go to a, a, a RAD center. They find out they don't meet the conditions and they can't have an MRI. And you just told them, hey, it's MRI conditional, whatever that means. They think MRI is okay. Um, and so you can have some upset patients. So really understand that, especially if you have a patient who, who needs an MRI. And then DRG stimulation, I'll, I'll tell you about how we do that in just a bit. But there currently is one company who's FDA approved. There's another that's FDA cleared, but really isn't making headway in this particular field. The, the market penetrance of this, of this uh, form of stimulation is really, really low. I think this is one of the most outstanding forms of stimulation out there. The outcomes are phenomenal. I have patients who, who basically have cures from pain rather than just attenuation of pain. Um, but it's, in my opinion, the most challenging procedure we do in interventional pain. Um, and, and I'll show you that. Uh, you'll see me struggle depending on what cadaver we have. Uh, but nonetheless, I'll give you the tips and tricks to help you understand how to do it. Uh, and then how to pick those patients as well. And then peripheral nerve stimulation, this has been a, an exploding market in the last five years. Um, prior to, I would say, seven years ago, I was doing peripheral nerve stimulation with the spinal cord stimulator systems. That's it. So I was using our normal octrodes and the IPGs uh, and, and doing the best I could. The problem with that is you're crossing joints, you have huge batteries. Um, so miniaturization, improvements in technology, improvements in capacitance, improvements in wireless communication between an external programmer to the lead has led to this explosion. And reimbursement, frankly, has, has come too. We're now, we are now, I wouldn't want to say incentivized, but we're at least breaking even with the things we need to do uh, for our patients. So here, here are all the examples. Uh, BioVentus uh, acquired by a nest, so you might be familiar with that. That's been around for, for many years. Um, Mainstay is, is one of the newer kids to the block. It's kind of separate. It's on its own. What they focus on is multifidus dysfunction um, for, for axial low back pain. NALU, as I mentioned, is the micro-IPG external therapy disc. SPR Therapeutics, you're going to see their, their system uh, with me performed. Uh, it's a really, really tiny coiled lead. Uh, basically, if you could put a needle in the human body, you can do this procedure. It's really straightforward and simple. Um, but again, uh, what we're missing is the condition-specific evidence there. It's a temporary system. It's left in for 60 days, and then you pull it out. Some patients go on to have long-term pain relief. And then Stimwave, um, I started working with them right out of fellowship, actually. Really interesting uh, technology, but has had some fluctuations uh, from the commercialization uh, but you may see some uh, people out there still using them. So what guidelines do you use to help you understand how to do things appropriately? I think these are, these are nice guidelines to follow as fellows. I, I would recommend printing these and just reviewing them because the NAC or Neurostimulation Appropriateness Consensus Committee is a group of experts that get together and they ask you questions. What do you do for infection prevention? What do you do for bleeding? What do you do for your management of antithrombotics? What do you do for seroma? What do you do for neurologic uh, injury afterwards? How do you manage those situations? So it's a really nice uh, primer to help you understand all of that before you actually get your hands on, on needles and, and scalpels. 
We also created one for DRG stimulation, um, which as I said, is, is a little bit more, I don't wanna say challenging, but is uh, complex. And so it's really important to understand ways to mitigate some complications that can occur. And then there's also one for intrathecal drug delivery. Uh, Dr. Askew will, will talk about intrathecal drug delivery systems tomorrow, I believe. All right, raise your hand if you're sick of all the societies out there. Yeah. So are all the industry partners. Everybody's sick of it. I'm sick of it. And as a fellow, I said, hey, why can't you guys consolidate? This drives me crazy. And then I went ahead and started another society. So here I am. Um, here's the issue. We all come from different backgrounds. Pain is multidisciplinary, right? So um, traditionally, our societies are based on our... Our boards. You're an orthopedic surgeon, you go to the orthopedic societies. You're an anesthesiologist, you go to the anesthesi anesthesiology societies. You're a physiatry, you go to physiatry societies. That's a problem when you deal with multidisciplinary situations like ours. Ours is very unique. We all get together. Yeah, we rib each other. Oh, you know, those anesthesiologists don't talk to patients or, you know, the surgeons just want to cut or whatever. But we're all friends. We all work together. And so the challenge is when you go to your parent society as an anesthesiologist, for example, pain is like one small sliver, right? And I'm sure for all of you in your different specialties, you go to you know, your, your mother or father society and, and what you do is a little bit different. Uh, so there are some societies that do a pretty good job with cross-disciplinary, multidisciplinary care. Um, and there are obviously here some pain specific societies. So. I'll give a shout out to IASP, which was actually started right over there, right over there, Issaquah, uh, with Dr. John Bonica uh, in the late, or the early 1970s. Uh, and that society, the IASP, is really important for pain research. So if you want to understand how to do pain research and, and really um, their journal is pain, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, good impact factor, that's a great society to get involved with from a research standpoint. Um, I mentioned I started a society, it's the Pacific Spine and Pain Society. It's a regional society for the West. The reason we started it is because we needed to do a better job breaking down silos between interventional pain, which includes anesthesia, physiatry, neurology, internal medicine, emergency medicine, radiology, and then spine surgeons, neurosurgeons, orthopedic spine surgeons. So this society is really meant to break down those barriers. Um, and a lot of the therapies we're talking about in the next two days are therapies that could be done by either side. And there are some very heated conversations about that. Who should be doing what? Who manages complications? How much should you be getting paid? And so this society was created to be that forum. Um, and it's been a lot of fun. Doug's been a part of it. Neil's going to be a part of it. <laughs> we're going to get him more involved. Um, so feel free to join us. The cool thing is everything's free with our society right now. Um, so that's a good price, uh, especially as a fellow. But these are all great societies to get involved with. You're going to see their different spins, different people. Um, good to get exposed. Um, Calendar-wise, for the next year, I kind of put up some dates here. Sure, I'm a little biased with PSPS, but these are all free. We have a neurostimulation lab, April 1st in Portland, spine surgery and minimally invasive spine lab, June 3rd in Denver, and then our annual meeting is in Oahu at the Four Seasons. The American Society of Pain and Neuroscience, a great meeting for you know, innovative therapies, um, July 13th through 16th at the Fontainebleau in Miami. Um, and then NANS is coming up here uh, in January, the North American Neuromodulation Society meeting that's in Las Vegas. It has been in Orlando the last couple of years, and now it's returning to Vegas where it's been for many years. Uh, there's also the International Neuromodulation Society uh, which is, of course, the international group regarding neuromodulation. We just had our meeting uh, in Barcelona this past May, and they're every two years. So the next meeting is going to be just up the road in Vancouver, 2024. Uh, really great meeting because you get to see how neurostimulation is done in, in Europe, Australia, Asia, and South America. It's always enlightening to see how people are doing things. You learn a lot more about how neurostimulation is used in cardiac and vascular care. Um, which isn't done as much in the United States, um, and then other forms of stimulation. And then we have a lot more of the innovative therapies uh, to market, such as the peripheral neurostimulator system. So they get to learn about some of those things. So it's a great, great way to network and, and learn about this field. And it's, it's not just an American field. It's a very international field that's growing every single year. 
And then in the last couple of minutes here, um, I want to talk about measuring your outcomes. So it's, it's, again, really cool to have all these toys to play with and, and med devices. But we are in a period of time where everyone wants to know what are your outcomes? What are your outcomes? How good are your patients doing? And so if you're not already learning this in your fellowship, um, really take this to heart. Here are just a, an example of things that could be measured. And, and always the pushback is like, your patients don't want to fill out all these forms and take all this time, right? So you have to find that balance of what, is, what are the right battery of tests to do? How do you do it so it doesn't annoy them? Uh, maybe they're slightly incentivized. But that you get that data to help you understand if what you're doing is good or not. If you don't do it yourself, someone else will. And that's going to likely be the payers, and they're already doing it right now, whether you know it or not. Um, so that's what helps them understand, should I pay for this therapy? They haven't gotten to a point where they say, we shouldn't let Dr. Naidu do these things anymore. Uh, and I hope they don't get to that point. But you could imagine a world in which that is the case. If someone or a group or a certain technology doesn't have good outcomes, they'll have the data. Um, so it's important that we start doing this ourselves. Um, I mentioned Taylor 6. There are other ways to get that information, registry data, intake forms, et cetera. But all I can say is however you do it, do it. Instill that now early in your career so it doesn't become a burden on you later on. And that's it with four minutes to spare. Are there any questions? Yes, please. In, in terms of incorporating some of those functional measures, how do you do that in your know, we do yeah. that in our fellowship. Great. But it's not necessarily incorporated in the data. It's more or less we kind of take that intake and it's more or less flawed. It's something that almost kind of burdens the note. I know so far yeah. I think providers aren't super happy that we have that in there. Yeah. So how do you have that? Program? Great question. So do you, do you, are you guys aware that on January 1st, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services mandated that you track a functional outcome after an epidural steroid injection? Okay. So if you guys aren't doing that, CMS in the next seven years can do an audit. And if they see you don't have that outcome, we'll retract all of that money for all of the epidural steroid injections that you've done. And for a number of practices, that can be a lot. So, so we have to do that. I mean, it's not even a question of should we. You have to do it if you want to get paid for what you do. So what we have been doing for the last um, three years, there is a particular platform I work with called Doctor Plan, which is uh, an, an, electric, an app where patients input their intake. So we set up a standardized questionnaire, which includes the questions for an Oz Westry Disability Index, a BPI, and a Promise 29. So basically, when patients go through it, the interface is really efficient and it, it looks like if you're familiar with the old Nest platforms that Google acquired, it's really like easy um, user interface with nice pictures. So they're able to like click on body parts that say where their pain is, rate their score with a scale. Um, and so we are always getting that data. Now, patients can choose not to do those things. We're not going to mandate it, but we're at least making the effort to get those scores. And one of the things we do is we, we tell patients, we need to know how we're doing. It really helps ourselves and our future patients by doing this. And for our community, that means a lot more than trying to give them a gift card or, or whatever else. Um, so they get it. They get the importance of tracking the outcomes. So that's how we automate getting functional scores, um, a BPI and a Promise 29 for everybody, no matter the, the intervention. I think this mandate will come to neurostimulation. Um, it's just a matter of time. So that's just one example. Um, you know, I think there are different electronic intake forms out there in the market that you can utilize. Some of these platforms are proprietary, you know, pay a subscription fee or whatever. Some are very free. So you have to figure that out, who you can use, who you cannot use. Um, Doug, Neil, do you guys have comments on who you use? Yeah, so we measure pretty much everything we do. We try to put everybody into a registry and... Uh, you know, the guy sitting to my left knows more or has forgotten more about registries than anybody will ever know. Um, and we try to, that's a good way to not only produce data, track your patients, contribute to the science. I can tell you that uh, last big registry we did was vertebral augmentation. 
And that was, we, met, we, we had a new LCD come back that was just awful, terrible. And we said, no, we're not, that, that's not going to be the, the LCD. What's the adjudication process? Oh, there is no adjudication process because we're a little bit new that year. We just essentially said, no, that can't happen. So we'll show you the data. And we went and met with every single Mac, <laughs> made conversations with all seven Macs, and made a presentation as to why the LCD was incorrect using data, primarily largest kyphoplasty trial. But the, the, real, the real cleanup hitter was the registry. Because the registry, we used the inclusion and exclusion cri criteria of Medicare, Noridian jurisdictions, E and F. So they had a hard time getting around that. They're like, so what's a randomized control trial? It, it may be level one evidence, but it's not applicable to the general population. And we even had a comment on two of those MACs that said, this is a randomized control trial. We said, no, it's, it's a registry and it uses Medicare criteria. So that's really hard to refute. And especially when the data was that the median pain score is from an eight to a zero uh, at six months. And Roland Morris went, went from a 21 to a seven. So that's, that's powerful stuff. So if you're able to do this, not only do you meet requirements, but you can contribute back to the literature. We just contributed a, a sacroplasty registry and the interim analysis, that same results. So you, you know, for people that said, oh, this doesn't work or that doesn't work. I mean, look, it's heterogeneous. Do it as it comes. This is what saved total joints, and this is what it will save the future of interventional pain. Great. I think it's time for Dr. Lee. Doug, are you moderating her? Or oh, Neil, you want to say something, please? Uh, the, um, uh, the in private practice, if you have an automated uh, data retrieval system that captures some or all of your patients, you have a huge stake in the game of continuing your practice. If you don't measure, then you are at the whim and will of the payer. Uh, and there are many examples of bureaucracy. Uh, and you can classically see if you just look at the transportation or highway department in whatever state you live, uh, there are six people leaning on shovels around a chuck hole and the chuck hole never really gets fixed. Um, so if you participate in these systems and use automated uh, measurement for your patients, uh, even if they don't participate in it, what CMS is asking is, do you have it? Because you can't coerce the patient. And if you do have it, no matter the degree of participation, you've avoided uh, the exposure that comes from not participating. You should participate in your practice and its future. 